Good morning, church. We're so glad that you could be here with us this morning. Uh, what a great day that God has made, and uh, we're, we're excited to get to worship with you here in a moment. But if this is your first time to be here with us, we encourage you to go to our website at salemheightschurch.org to learn more information about our church family and the different things that we're doing uh, in this season. Uh, we're, we're so excited that we get to worship alongside of you, and Lord willing, see you here soon. Uh, so have a great morning, and have a blessed day. Well, good morning, Salem Heights family. We welcome you here today. Guests, we're glad that you've joined us. Uh, I wanted us to be thinking about a particular verse as we're uh, getting ready to worship here. It's out of uh, Psalm 104. It says this, I will sing to the Lord all my life, and I will sing praise to my God as long as I live, and may the meditation of my heart be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. And so we know that he sees down to our core and he recognizes our motivation. So let's worship him wholeheartedly today because he's worthy of that.
and praise the Father, and praise the Son, and praise the Spirit, three in one, and God of glory and majesty, and praise forever to the King. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came run there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the Father, you are worthy of every bit of praise today. Jesus, you are worthy of every bit of praise for all that you've done, for purchasing us, Jesus, with your blood. 
We stand here thankful today for those of us who know you, who have been washed by you. God, we are so thankful. We are not worthy. We know that. But we are thankful. We know that your word says, above all things in this life, be thankful that our names are recorded in the book of life. God, we know that we have life eternal to look forward to. God, I would pray that while we are here, we are doing your will, doing your work, being faithful to you, because one day we are going to come face to face with you. And we want to be ready for that moment. And hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. God, I would pray that you would refine us with your word today, that you would drive it deep in our hearts, that we would be willing to listen, be willing to change whatever it is that you're asking us to do. So we would pray that you'd help us now. In Christ's precious name, amen. Well, good morning, church. It's so good to be with you this morning. And if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to grab them and open to the little book of Jonah in the Old Testament. Uh, one of the things that you might not know about me is that I like spicy food. I didn't always like spicy food, but as I've gotten older, um, I have kind of a slogan, the hotter, the better. And some people talk about how that it can, heat can ruin the food, um, but I just find it to be exhilarating and, and to fun to try new things as I've had some opportunities to travel in missions. But I was doing some research, and uh, each year they put out a list of the hottest peppers in the world. Uh, there's actually a Guinness Book World Record for that. And uh, there is a new pepper that is, people are not sure if it's true, if it actually exists, but a guy named Mike Smith in Wales has created a pepper that he has named Dragon's Breath. And I wanted to show you a picture here just of how small this, paper, uh, this pepper is because it's, what's amazing to me is this little pepper is actually too hot to eat. He claims that it's so hot it could literally kill the person who eats it. I could cause them to stop breathing and uh, that there are other uses for this pepper and why he created it. But this little pepper can have a big punch. Well, the reason I share that story is Jonah is a little book in the Old Testament. It's considered what we call a minor prophet. But when we hear that term minor prophet, we need to remember that it's not speaking to the importance of what's being written or its relevance, but it's actually just speaking to the size of the book. Uh, the book of Jonah is only about 1,300 words. It's four chapters long. And actually, it's a pretty well-known book in the Bible. In fact, believers and unbelievers all over the world are familiar with this story in the Bible about a man being swallowed by a giant fish. What's interesting to note is that if you were to read through all four chapters of Jonah, the actual part that talks about Jonah and the fish is only a couple verses. There's a lot more that goes into the story and why it's been included in the Bible. And so this morning, I want us to kind of look at Jonah and his life as we're in our series about uh, prayers that have come from people who are in fracture. And Jonah offers a prayer in chapter 2 that we're going to get to in just a little bit. But as we look at this story, I want us to know that this is actually true. Some people actually question whether or not uh, Jonah was a real person, whether or not this whole story about a man being swallowed by a great fish is actually true. I believe it is. And one of the reasons I believe that is because Christ believed it was true. If you read in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12, Jesus actually points to Jonah as an illustration um, that relates to himself. In fact, Jonah is the only prophet whom Jesus relates himself to. That just like Jonah, who was going to be in the belly of this great fish for three days and three nights, so Jesus would be in the tomb for three days, three nights, but would rise again and be a sign to the people of what God was planning to do, the salvation that God was offering to mankind. And so Jonah here in this story is going to find himself in a tough situation. I think there's actually a better um, correlation or maybe a better example uh, in the New Testament that kind of helps us understand who Jonah was, and that's actually the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, there's actually several pastors and commentators who have made this connection between the story of Jonah and the story that we see in Luke 15 about a man and his two sons, one of them that was a prodigal. A prodigal is just someone who goes away and, and, and lives life recklessly. They're wasteful, they're selfish, they're in a state of rebellion, and then they find themselves then in a situation where uh, they're hopeless. They can't really go forward anymore. Uh, maybe those resources, those opportunities have ceased, and now they can't go back. 
I think about in, in our lives some of the ways that we can find ourselves in these kinds of situations. I grew up playing baseball. My dad was a baseball coach and uh, I'm one person who's thankful that sports are starting to come back in some fashion. But if you're not a fan of baseball, one of the things um, that you might not know is there's all kinds of idioms in baseball that people who follow baseball will use as they're talking about the sport that you might have no idea what they're talking about. If you hear somebody say, can of corn, they're actually talking about a fly ball that's easy to catch. Another one of those idioms is a pickle. And a pickle just refers to when a base runner gets caught between two bases and has to run back and forth trying not to get tagged out by the opposing team. Uh, the word pickle is just speaking to a tough spot where you can't go forward and you can't go back. I, I think we often find ourselves in pickles. Situations where maybe because of a lie, uh, perhaps because we've burnt bridges in relationships, perhaps because we've disregarded wise counsel, we find ourselves now in a situation because of our pride, our selfishness, uh, because of poor choices where that didn't really turn out, but we really feel like we have no option to go back to what once was. Jonah's going to find himself in a similar situation this morning as we read in Jonah chapter 1 and Jonah chapter 2. So what I'd like for us to do this morning is this. I would like for us to consider Jonah's perspective. What was it that caused him to end up in this situation? Uh, what was his predicament and then what was his prayer? And so if you have your Bibles open to Jonah chapter 1, let's start in verse 1. It says this, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach against it, because their evil has come up before me. Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. Now, you might ask a question, well, that's not where, did I misread my Bible? Is this an error in it? The Lord said, go to Nineveh, and it says that he got up. You're thinking, okay, he's going to get up and respond in obedience to God. But what does he do? He goes to Tarshish. Now, geographically, Tarshish is like the exact opposite direction of what God wanted him to do. And so he gets up, and, and he doesn't listen to the Lord. Why is that? Well, if you continue to read on here throughout all four chapters of Jonah, you quickly learn that Jonah was a nationalist. He believed in God's promises to the Jewish people, the Israelites, and he actually had a disdain for every other person. He did not care for Gentiles. And so when God is saying, go up and go to Nineveh, he's saying, go to these people outside of the Israelites and go and warn them that judgment is coming. Go and warn them that their wickedness, I have seen it and I'm going to punish it unless they repent. But Jonah doesn't want to offer that to them. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, and Assyria had a, a reputation of being uh, oppressive, being wicked, being evil. And so in Jonah's mind, this idea was a bad idea. I wonder if you've ever had that thought, where you read the scriptures and you see something God's uh, given us as a command or an instruction, or perhaps it's the Holy Spirit inside of you saying, Hey, I want you to respond in this way. Hey, I want you to go serve in this way. I want you to sacrifice in this way. And instead of getting up and going in obedience, your first instinct or your first thought is, that's a bad idea. I don't agree. I don't see what God is trying to do. And so Jonah's perspective was he had no care for the Gentile people. He especially had no care for the Ninevites. He did not want to help them. He did not want to warn them. He did not want to see them repent and have God choose to withhold his judgment from that. But then the story gets worse. It tells us in Jonah chapter 1, verse 4, that, But the Lord threw a great wind unto the sea, and such a great storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. So for those who are familiar with the story, Jonah gets on a boat to go to Tarshish, and as he's going there, sailing there, a huge storm comes upon the sea, so much so that these experienced sailors, it tells us in verse 5, were afraid, and each cried out to his God. They began throwing the ship's cargo into the sea to lighten the load. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down to the lowest part of the vessel and had stretched out and had fallen into a deep sleep. And so these men are are worried. And so there's a storm now that's coming. And they go down and they find Jonah asleep. And it says in verse 6, the captain approached him and said, what are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call to your God. Maybe this God will consider us and we won't perish. 
what we see here is that on this ship there are obviously different people who believe in different gods and so they are so afraid and, and the situation is so dire that they're saying to everybody whatever you believe and whomever you believe in begin to call out to that god and see who can save us see if there is any deliverance that we might be able to have so what we learn here though is jonah doesn't pray he doesn't call out to his god and again they begin to try to figure out you know, why is this happening this has to be something supernatural there this has to be the result of some sort of supernatural divine punishment because this storm is completely uh, something that they were not prepared for and maybe they had never seen before and so they begin to it says cast lots to determine uh, who maybe was responsible for this and it identified Jonah as being the cause and even then Jonah doesn't offer any explanation besides the fact that I'm a Hebrew uh, I worship the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land and that I'm fleeing from him and so the men say what should we do then if you're the one responsible for this if it's because of your disobedience or your poor choices that your God is causing all of us now to suffer in this storm what should we do to get away Jonah doesn't tell him tell them to pray. He doesn't say we need to repent to God for what I've done. No, instead Jonah because of his disdain for even those sailors, he didn't want to help those people, says throw me over the boat and this will go away. It's almost as if Jonah's saying, "I am so stubborn, I would rather die than to even help you guys." Jonah does not pray one time. And so he finds himself in this predicament. But it says that God caused a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of that fish three days and three nights. As I think about what Jonah is going through and what, what he might have been thinking, it, it seems that it, was all, it wasn't until he got into this really, really dark place inside the belly of this fish for multiple days. It might have not even been right when he got swallowed that he began to pray. It doesn't give us an indication. It says that he was swallowed, that he was in there for three days, and then it says, then Jonah prayed from the belly of the fish. But here's the first thing I want to highlight. It's this. The path of prayerlessness is a steep descent into despair. All along the way, Jonah had these opportunities where he could have prayed. When God said, get up and go to Nineveh, he could have prayed and sought God's wisdom. Like, God, why are you doing this? Help me understand. He didn't do it. He fled. When the storm came, instead of realizing that this might be the result of his disobedience and praying out to God saying, God, please uh, stop this storm. Don't cause these other men to suffer or potentially perish. He doesn't pray. Uh, when they say, what should we do to stop this from happening? He doesn't say, we need to pray. And even in the fish, when he's down there, it's almost like I can see him stubborn. <laughs> he's just so staunch in his beliefs. He believes he is right. He believes that God is wrong, and he does not want to do what God has said. But that path of prayer, prayerlessness didn't lead him to victory. It didn't lead him to peace. It didn't lead him to safety and security. It led him in to despair. You know, it tells us uh, if you go outdoors at all here in the Northwest, it's important to know what to do if, if you kind of get disoriented. If you've ever been in the woods, it's actually quite easy. If you get off a trail, everything starts to look the same. And it, especially if it's an unfamiliar territory, uh, it can be really easy to find yourself lost in the woods, which would be actually a pretty scary thing. But if you go online or there's other resources out there, they actually will tell you what should you do if you get lost in the woods. And I was looking up one website and it said this, if you find yourself lost in the woods, you should stop. It actually uses stop as an acronym, S-T-O-P. It says you should stop, think, observe, and plan. It basically is assess what's going on, realize where, where you're at, try to find your bearings, and try to get back to where you were. But then it says this, if you cannot do that quickly, if, you, if it doesn't come back to you, stay put. You can actually do much more harm trying to find your way back than if you were just to stay. I think we should change that acronym a little bit. I think that when we find ourselves in situations that are getting hard, or trials, or perhaps we find ourselves, we're starting to come to our senses, and we're starting to realize that maybe we've been making sinful choices, that we're not living in God's will, I think we need to first stop. We need to think. We need to observe what's going on. But then we need to pray. 
We need to ask the Lord, God, give me supernatural insight here. Help me to see this as you see it. Give me the the desire, Lord, even to walk away from what I'm doing and how attractive I might be or how entangled I might feel in it. And God, help me to get back heading in the direction that you want me to be going in. And so Jonah finds himself in the belly of this fish. And in chapter 2, we read his prayer. Would you join me? Verse 1 of chapter 2 says this, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. I called to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. I cried out for help from deep inside Sheol. You heard my voice. You threw me into the depths, into the heart of the seas, and the current overcame me. All your breakers and your billows swept over me. But I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. The water engulfed me up to the neck. The watery depths overcame me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. I sank to the foundations of the mountains. The earth's gates shut behind me forever. Then you raised my life from the pit, Lord my God. As my life was fading away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, to your holy temple. Those who cherish worthless idols abandon their faithful love. But as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation belongs to the Lord. One of the things you might not notice when you first read Jonah's prayer here, that he prays while he's inside the fish, is that he is actually quoting scripture. Several of these statements within his prayer here in those nine verses, you can actually draw a direct correlation to Psalms, different Psalms. Over nine times you see these correlations. So what does Jonah do when he finally hits rock bottom? He actually begins to pray scripture. And so this leads us to the second thing I want us to think about. When you find yourself in that situation, when you don't have the words, use God's. When you don't know what to pray, how to pray, when you don't have the words, you don't know how to express what you're feeling, you don't even know how, what you're asking God for, use God's words. Uh, a few years ago, we had Donald Whitney here at Salem Heights, and uh, he wrote a book called Praying in the Bible. And there were a couple of quotes that he had in the book that I remembered as we were talking about how the scriptures can help us. Uh, the book is called Praying the Bible. And in it, one of the people he quotes is Johnny Erickson Tata, who uh, applied these, this, this practice to her own life. And she says this, I have learned to season my prayers with the Word of God. It's a way of talking to God in His language, speaking His dialect, using His vernacular, employing His idioms. This is not a matter simply of divine vocabulary. It's a matter of power. When we bring God's word directly into our praying, we are bringing God's power into our praying. Hebrews 4.12 declares, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. God's word is living, and so it infuses our prayers with life and vitality. God's word is also active, injecting energy and power into our prayer. I think that's so true. That one of the things that comes when we pray the scriptures When we don't know what else to say, it actually infuses our prayers with the power of the word. The second illustration that he gives in the book is of George Mueller. And we've talked about George Mueller before. George Mueller was a man who uh, lived in England, and he had uh, actually felt called to uh, reach out to orphans and to take care of those who didn't have parents. It's said to believe that, uh, that he was a man of prayer who prayed every day and that there were tens of thousands of kids who were impacted by his calling, his ministry. But he too also found himself applying prayer to, uh, praying the word of God to his prayers. He says this, The difference then between my former practice and my present one is this. Formerly when I rose, I began to pray as soon as possible, and generally spent all my time till breakfast in prayer, or almost all the time. At all events, I almost invariably began with prayer. But what was the result? I often spent a quarter of an hour or a half an hour or even an hour on my knees before being conscious to myself of having derived comfort, encouragement, humbling of soul, etc. And often after suffering much from wandering of the mind for the first 10 minutes or quarter of an hour, even half an hour, I only then began to pray. 
I scarcely suffer even now in this way, from my heart being nourished by the truth, being brought into experiential fellowship with God. I speak to my father and to my friend, vile though I am and unworthy of it, about the things that he has brought before me in his precious word. I often now, it often now astonishes me that I did not sooner see this point. What is Mueller saying here? He said, for a long time I got up and I was committed to praying to God, to in inviting him into my thoughts and into my actions, give, asking him for wisdom. But he's like, I would find myself being there for an hour and going, Man, I haven't prayed about anything yet. My mind's been wandering. I got comfortable in my chair. I was getting sleepy. He says, now I begin to pray the scriptures. Let God's word direct me. And I don't ever wander in the same way. See, when we pray the Bible, it also brings focus to our prayer. And so at his lowest point, Jonah cries out to God. It says here in those first couple of verses of Jonah chapter 2, he said, I prayed to the Lord. I called out to him in my distress and he answered me. I cried to him for help and he heard my voice. God hears those who are calling out to him. Uh, sometimes we can feel like in our deepest struggles that God is far away. But Jonah, even here in the belly of the fish, goes, I cried out to God and he heard me, even to the depths. I mean, he's talking about being at the foundations of the mountain. He's like, I am low, not only spiritually, emotionally, I'm physically in the ocean. And yet God heard me. And then he makes this statement two times. He says he directs his attention or he directs his prayer to the holy temple. And what Jonah is saying here is, as I started to cry out to God, Jonah didn't know which way the temple was. He's probably very disoriented inside the, the belly of this fish. But it says, I directed my attention to the temple. What did he mean by that? Well, the temple was the place where the mercy seat was. It was, the, it was the place where once a year the priest would go in and sprinkle a blood of a sacrifice on the mercy seat, atoning for the sins of the people and restoring relationship with God. When Jonah started to come to his senses, he looked to God's mercy. He looked to the place where, God, would you be merciful on me? I have, I have been rebellious. I have been selfish. I have not been obedient to you, but God, I'm asking you to be merciful to me. You know what's an awesome truth for us today, believer? It's now we don't look to the mercy seat. We look to the cross. The precious blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, was shed on our behalf. Our sins now are forgiven. And that is our, our access to having our relationship re restored with God. Even if, if you or I are prodigals, even if we've been walking in rebellion, we haven't been listening, we haven't been trusting, we haven't been uh, seeking God, we can now, because of Christ, we have direct access to the Father. We can go back to Him. We can repent. We can confess our sins. And the promise of Scripture is we can be near God. And so Jonah makes this vow. He says, at the end of his prayer, he said, I'm going to make a vow to give you praise, Lord. I'm going to thank you. How is it that Jonah can say this? I'm going to worship you, Lord. How, how, he hadn't been released yet. He was still inside the fish and yet he's like, this is what I'm, I'm going to do. I'm, gonna, I'm making a vow that I'm going to offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to you. I'm going to lift my voice to praise you, God. What did Jonah have to be thankful for? He was still inside the fish. Well, it's because he believed that salvation belongs to the Lord. That's what he says. I, I trust that God, you're in control. That God, you can save me. That God, you are one who cares for me. And that leads us to the third and last point that I want us to consider this morning. And that is this. Renewed faith is built on our relationship with Christ, not outcomes. When we are truly trusting the Lord, when our faith is genuine, we can have confidence in the midst of despair and struggle because our relationship with God means that we will never be left or forsaken. We are never alone. That He will continue to provide for us. We can know that even though he might be letting us go through something, that he has not just abandoned us there. See, genuine faith, those people who really are excited about the Lord, those people that have peace in the midst of hard times, it's not because they know for sure that that problem or that challenge or that infirmity is going to be lifted today or the next day or the next week. They just trust that God's in control. And whether that, that is removed from them here in this life, it won't follow them to the next life where they're going to be with God forever in heaven. And so renewed faith, when we truly are trusting in God, 
Our confidence comes from our relationship with the one who has all the power, has all the wisdom. Genuine faith is not built on outcomes. You know what that means? That means genuine faith is not, well, I will believe God because he continues to answer everything I'm asking him to do. No, genuine faith says, I will trust God because he's God, whether or not he answers my prayer because he is good. You see, the prodigal's path to peace starts with prayer. And then look what happens. It says in the end of chapter 2, verse 10, Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. That sounds disgusting. But now Jonah's out. He's alive. And look what it says in the first couple of verses of chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach the message that I tell you. Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. What a difference. First time the Lord commanded him to go to Nineveh, he went the opposite way. This time, he went to where God called him to go. He heard God. God heard him. God answered him. And God gave Jonah a second chance. Do you believe that's true? God is a God of second chances. He has made it really clear that those who turn to him in faith, that those who confess their sins, that those who seek him will find him, that he will forgive sins. He is a God who is merciful and gracious, a God who is able to set us free from the sins that trip us up, a God who is able to give us victory, a God who is able to restore us and redeem us and give us a new purpose and a new calling. How about you this morning? As we wrap up our time together, I think we probably all of us would find ourselves in one of two conditions. The first would be that maybe we struggle to be prodigal at times, that we uh, have not listened to the Lord. Maybe it's because we haven't actually been spending time in His Word or spending time just thinking about what we know about His Word, but maybe God has been really speaking clearly to us and we are uh, not listening. How should we respond if we are prodigal? Well, if we will humble ourselves, the scriptures tell us a couple of things. In the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, it says that the son comes up with this great response to tell the father, that he's hoping the father will just take him back as a servant. And it says in Luke chapter 15, verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it, and let's celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Isn't that amazing? If you find yourself this morning identifying more with the prodigal, more with Jonah, saying, I haven't been listening to the Lord. I haven't been following what he is saying. I haven't been doing what he has called me to do. Call out to him. The path of the prodigal that leads to peace starts with prayer. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. If you are a prodigal and you're hearing this message today, this is what you need. You need God's grace and you need his mercy. And if you have faith in Christ, you have access to go and receive those things right now. But the second way you might find yourself or the second kind of scenario would be that you're more like the lost. You might be more like the Ninevites. Or, or the sailors who were on that boat that threw Jonah over the side. Perhaps you haven't believed in Christ. Perhaps the Bible and Christianity, this is all new to you. What's, what do we want you to hear this morning? Well, we read back in Jonah chapter 1, it tells us that those men, once they threw Jonah over the side, it tells us that, uh, the storm, in verse 15, they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men seized by great fear of the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. These men saw what God did, and that led them 
to faith. Perhaps you're hearing the story of Jonah and you're hearing now also about what Christ has done, that he came to earth, he died on the cross for your sins, which was the penalty for your sin, but he paid that penalty. Now he offers you the benefit of salvation, forgiveness, a relationship with God by believing. And perhaps you're hearing that today for the first time, but if the Lord is is causing that to be something that you realize and that's what you want, the Bible tells us in In Romans chapter 10, this amazing promise, starting in verse 8. It says, The message is near you in your mouth and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you find yourself this morning hearing this message about Jonah and his prayer, but you identify more with the Ninevites, This message is for you to hear that Christ did come and offered himself as the perfect sacrifice and that you today could have salvation if you will believe in Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. That's my desire for you. When we find ourselves in the depths of despair, caused oftentimes by our own struggles and sins, the path to peace starts with prayer. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you so much for Jonah and the story, Lord. Um, There's a lot to learn from his mistakes, but there's also a lot to learn about you and your grace and your mercy that you poured out on him. And God, I just pray this morning that we would hear this prayer and we would see that, God, we have sometimes not even the words to know what to say to you, how how to apologize, how to, maybe sometimes we feel like we need to convince you that we really are sorry, we will never do it again, but Really what we need to do, Lord, is just to to pray your words, to to pray your scriptures, to to put that in your hands and just say, God, I, I have sinned. I'm sorry. I confess that. Would you make me clean? Would you would you restore me? Would you give me new desires? Would you set my feet back on the rock? Would you point me back in the right directions? Would you cause me to follow you rather than my own way or my own opinions? God, we're living in a time right now where there, there are a lot of people that are hurting and there are a lot of people who, who need to hear about the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need to hear about this free gift of salvation. And yet, God, we are living in a day and age where it is easy to feel like we have a lot of enemies, a lot of people we don't agree with. Father God, I would pray that we would learn from Jonah that that's not what you've called us to be. We are your ambassadors. We are called to go out to the least of these, to go to those who we would even say we do not have anything in common and to realize that they need to hear the gospel too, God. So help us to be those who see the lost as image bearers, those who need to hear the gospel, and that we would not be like Jonah, resistant to help them, but that we would be used by you to be proclaimers of the truth, God. God, I pray that you would use this message to stir us up today to live for you. I pray this in your son's beautiful name.